Next we have Milin Tambe. Milin Tambe is Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of Center for Research in Computation and Society at Harvard University. He is also Director AI for Social Good at Google Research India. Milin Tambe's research focuses on advancing AI and multi-agent system research for social good, AI for protection of endangered wildlife, forests, and fisheries. AI for public health and social work, and AI for public safety and security. Over to you, sir. All right, thank you. Sorry for the delay, but we will uh, go ahead and get started. So I'm going to be uh, talking about AI for social good. And so uh, what an excellent presentation uh, from Rajiv. So I really, uh, awesome, awesome, really fantastic. So uh, he's already talked a lot about AI, but I'll talk to you about my own uh, experience. So I started uh, uh, doing research in AI in 1986 when I started my PhD. And at that point, AI was not really a very well-known word. And so um, there's no, even now there's not a single, you know, there's no single agreed upon definition of AI. We can think about AI as computer systems that solve problems requiring intelligence when done by humans. I should tell you, when I uh, started my PhD, I would go to conferences, and people would say it was a small academic discipline before it became all this big thing. And the person next to me would say, what do, you, what do you work on? And I said, I do AI research. And he would look suspiciously at me and say, artificial insemination. <laughs> and it, it, it took a uh, you know, while now to kind of, uh... so now we have, um, you know, AI everywhere, when we type a search string, it AI is what completes things. There's, you know, if you think about Netflix making recommendations, facial recognition with all its uh, ethical issues, driverless cars is what we will see in a big way as a general public, as the use of AI. I wanted to, though, uh, make a distinction between AI, which is predictive and making recommendations. So this is making predictions based on your past uh, viewing habits. And then there's planning, as in planning a route. And so both these are also AI. So when you, when you uh, ask Google to plan a path, for example. So AI is many techniques under one umbrella. Um, it's machine learning and deep learning. It's language processing. It's also game theory. It's also decision theory. It's also all these kinds of different things that are all part of AI. So uh, there's clearly, a, you know, this is an old slide, uh, you know, lots and lots of investments and all kinds of things that are happening in the business world with AI. But the focus of my work has been AI for social impacts, generally speaking, in areas where nonprofits operate. And so I'll be, for the past many years, we've focused on three areas, public safety and security, conservation and public health. Work started... Uh, uh, in public safety and security. I grew up in Mumbai, and uh, given all the terrorist attacks that were happening uh, some years ago, this is the topic that I gravitated towards and then moved on. In all of this work, the key research challenge uh, that we focus on is how to optimize our limited intervention resources. And the particular part of AI that I uh, work in is called multi-agent systems. And so the kinds of tools and techniques we bring to the table are things like game theory, reasoning about networks, and so forth. So a concrete example is work we've been doing for conservation, endangered wildlife. So there's large conservation areas to protect limited range of resources. And so concrete example is work we've been doing in Uganda, Cambodia, and other countries where taking into account past poaching data, we are able to predict where poachers will set traps or snares and remove them before they kill animals. Um, work is being extended towards combating illegal fishing, illegal logging, and other kinds of environmental crime. Public health uh, is the other area. Here we may have limited number of social worker or public uh, health resources. So concrete example is work we've done for HIV prevention, for example, in Los Angeles. So taking into account the social networks of homeless youth, we select key peer leaders to spread information about HIV amongst these youth. And we've shown that our algorithms are more effective 
in spreading information about HIV compared to traditional approaches. And HIV testing rates have gone up as a result. But same kinds of ideas could be used for suicide prevention, for substance abuse prevention. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing here for tuberculosis prevention in its very early stages. In the past, uh, we've worked a lot with uh, optimizing limited security resources for public safety and security. We have a large number of targets to protect limited security resources, how to schedule or plan or allocate these resources, taking into account a watchful adversary. We've contributed new models and algorithms that have been in use by security agencies in the United States. So, for example, uh, you know, they're gun carrying secret police on planes. These are air marshals. So there's thousands of flights every day. Not every flight can carry air marshals. So we developed an algorithm based on game theoretic calculations on which flight should carry air marshals on a randomized basis. So if you've been on a US air carrier, United, Delta, American, and so on, whether there was an air marshal or not on your flight may have been decided by our program. Or Coast Guard patrols in different ports and so forth. The model's being extended in other countries. So more recently, I took over as uh, director of AI for social good at uh, Google. So we held a workshop in Bangalore at uh, Google Research. And out of that workshop, we've launched several projects uh, in the space of public health and welfare, human wildlife conflict in education, and an announcement on these projects will be coming out relatively soon. So if you look at all of this, there's some common themes. First, uh, interdisciplinary partnerships, use of multi-agent systems reasoning, because that's my area, and a data to deployment pipeline. So all of this work is only possible because of the interdisciplinary partnerships with government and non-governmental organizations. So to that end, we have really patrolled with the US Coast Guard on their boats uh, in New York, for example, or really patrolled with wildlife conservation agencies in different forests in Malaysia or Cambodia. Our students have spent time in homeless shelters trying to understand how things operate. This immersion is important for us in order to understand what kind of data to collect, what kind of problems to really address. And this is a partnership and not something where we go off on our ivory, into our ivory towers and develop a program and say, Here, here's what to use. Based on this data, then we build a predictive model. This is where we may predict some cases are high risk and some cases are low risk. But our resources are limited, so we can't intervene on all of the high-risk cases. So a prescriptive algorithm, intervention uh, algorithm, basically suggests which cases to actually intervene on, given our limited resources, to optimize our outcomes. And what is crucial for us is actually to field test and deploy these applications. We are talking about AI for social impact. And unless there's actual social impact through field tests and deployments, this is not really AI for social impact. And so uh, that part is really important for us. And again, this means interacting with our partners, really deploying things. So I'll start uh, with this example that uh, we've been working on for the past several years on wildlife protection. So this is Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. Um, I was there, and there's some wonderful wildlife there. It's just terrific to see this. But there's threats to the wildlife. The traps or snares that are used in order to maim and kill animals. This is poaching given billions of dollars that are, you know, this, this market of illegal wildlife trade and poaching and so forth. This is in billions and billions of dollars. But this is not, you know, there are thousands of these snares placed every year to maim and kill these animals. So the question for us is, can we predict ahead of time who, uh, where these poachers are going to attack? By the way, I'm going to put in the top right hand corner, pictures of my students or postdocs who have led these individual projects. So this is um, a Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. And we are going to divide up this park into one kilometer by one kilometer grid squares. And given thousands and thousands of square kilometers, we are trying to predict which of these grid squares actually have snares so that we can ask rangers to go there and remove them. So we, had, we have past poaching data, given range of patrol frequency in each grid location and features of the cell, we are trying to predict the probability of finding a snare in each cell. So uh, we have all of this data, for example, in the first example we did, 12 years of poaching data from Uganda. Range of patrol frequency, all of that data is available to us for each grid square. How frequently did the rangers go to that grid cell, for example? 
uh, we have uh, distance to rivers and roads and villages for each grid square. And then we are trying to predict the probability of finding a snare. And so there's a machine learning system, an ensemble of uh, different things that we generate. Uh, Gaussian processes is the latest one. I'm not going to go through details of that. So we can do lots of tests in the lab. We can publish papers. All of that is good. But then when we come to say, OK, now, Wildlife Conservation Society or Uganda Wildlife Authority, please start using our software. That's, they're saying, no, no, no. First, you got to show us it actually works. So the first test was in 2016. So uh, they asked us to find two new areas where poaching has happened that they haven't discovered before. So here's what we did. We said, here's two nine square kilometer areas uh, as shown there. And so these are the green dots. And we are going to ask you to patrol here. These are infrequently patrolled in the past. And these are not previous hotspots. So we're not asking rangers to just go back to where you have found snares before to go to new areas. And the red dots are where they found poaching hotspots before. So you can see that we are asking them to patrol in very different areas. So this was done one month before a conference deadline. So that meant that if we ask after doing this, we asked rangers to go find snares. If the rangers found snares in these locations, then we will be able to write a paper. If there are no snares, there's not going to be any paper. And so rangers went out. Every day, they would go on patrol, and they sent us an email, what happened today. And initially, there was no reports. Then a poached elephant with its tusks cut off. So machine learning system was telling us to go in the right place, but we were just too late for this elephant. By the way, I used to have a picture of uh, the elephant with its tusk cut off, and somebody in the audience started crying. So then I, after that, I stopped showing pictures of poached uh, elephants and so forth. But then there came, so we were too late for this elephant. But then came good news. A whole elephant snare roll was found and removed. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants. But before they could kill the next set of elephants, we removed the elephant snare roll, hopefully saving lives of elephants. And then antelope snare rolls were found and removed. A paper has um, our hit rate, base hit rate, all of that. The main point uh, here was that there's hope that this machine learning system is working in the right direction. On a side note, since this was this one month challenge and we really wanted to write the paper, I told my students, if you do a good job, for every snare uh, that is found and removed, I'll buy you a drink. Uh, at this point, it's like, okay, we can't drink anymore. So this is good. But the question is, can we do this on a much larger scale? Because this is Uganda, maybe we lucked out you know, two places, weren't equal, frequently patrolled, maybe you know, it worked out. So we did a second test, two national parks in Uganda, where 24 areas each we predict, made predictions on. Some we said were high risk, more snares would be found. Some we said were low risk, less number of snares would be found. And then we sent rangers out for six months. They didn't know which areas we predicted to be what. Our colleagues in Wildlife Conservation Society had the maps. And then the rangers went out. And again, where we predicted high risk, more snares were found. We predicted low risk, less number of snares were found. So this system is really trying to do a good job making predictions. Following that in Murchison Falls, we had high, medium, and low risk predictions. And again, where we predicted high risk, more snares were found. So this is really working in a good way. There's a lot of hope here that this is really working. It is my belief that we really have to stress test these systems. And so recently, we started working in uh, Cambodia. This is uh, SWS, Sripak Wildlife Sanctuary, where tigers are going to be reintroduced. You may know that uh, in three Southeast Asian countries, tigers have been decimated. So there's no more tigers left. And so World Wildlife Fund and others are trying to reintroduce tigers. Uh, the story of tigers is really bad. I mean, there's a lot of news about, you know, tigers are rebounding, but it's not so optimistic. In some countries, they've gone. So this is, uh, this is where it's important to catch poachers and snares. And so we visited, uh, which uh, Sri Park Wildlife Sanctuary, as I said, it's very important for us that we go to the spot and work with the rangers there. So this is a gentleman who was a former Khmer Rouge soldier who's become a ranger. That's our picture with the different rangers. There's poachers being captured. And so again, uh, we went out. We made predictions about where they will find snares. 
again, we made predictions about high risk, high risk and low risk areas. And so these were pictures of them finding all these traps and snares. So we were very happy uh, that this is, this is found. And again, our predictions worked out. And the numbers of snare uh, captures jumped significantly after our uh, predictions came in. So one of the best emails I got was from the head of uh, World Wildlife Fund Zero Poaching Effort, Rohit Singh, saying, I'm super excited with the results. Let's get going with the other countries too this year. So this is what we are now doing. Uh, we have uh, teamed up with Microsoft's AI for Earth and Smart Partnership, which is a partnership of WWF, WCS, and all these other wildlife conservation agencies. And we now re released this PAUSE software, this predictive software, for hundreds of national parks around the globe. So this should be coming online this spring. And so you should be able to, we, we are really hopeful. What this means is that this program is going to aid rangers around the world trying to protect wildlife. So, and this can then be extended toward protecting fisheries, forests, and so forth. So, so far I've talked to you about predictions made from here where there's past data. Could we do more things in the field directly with data? And so that's work that we've been doing with drones. And so this is work uh, with Air Shepherd, which is an NGO uh, that operates in Kruger National Park in South Africa. So they take these videos, uh, infrared videos, late at night, and then they beam it to a van. So the idea is that the drone is flying late at night. It uh, gets this infrared video. And a human being is sitting in this van, looking at this video, trying to find human pictures in this. You can see it's not very easy to spot human beings in this. It's white hot. And late at night, not so easy. So we developed a system called Spot to automatically detect poachers in this video. So any human being operating late at night in this park is a poacher and potentially a poacher. So then we can spot animals, we can spot people, and we've given this out to this NGO to test. So let me now switch gears and talk to you about another effort in social, work, uh, in social good, which is uh, work with public health. So this is work we've done in Los Angeles. Uh, this is with the homeless youth in LA. Unfortunately, there are 6,000 homeless youth who sleep on the streets of LA every night. The rates of HIV amongst the homeless youth are 10 times the rates of normal house populations. And so to combat this, homeless shelters will train. I mean, you can't go and talk to every single homeless youth. So the basic idea is they'll pick peer leaders, educate them about HIV. And the idea is that the peer leaders will talk to their friends, and their friends will talk to their friends, and information will spread in this fashion. This is social network at work, but this is not Facebook. This is actual, real face-to-face -face interactions. So this is how it's supposed to work. You take a social network. These are face-to-face -face interactions. You pick one person, let's say A, then there's a probability of 0.4 that A will talk to B, and some probability B will talk to C, and information will cascade and spread in this fashion. So this is a... In this case, what we are trying to pick are a number of peer leaders and educate them. So this is a problem in computer science called influ influence maximization. Given a social network, you're trying to pick K peer leader nodes so that we maximize the numbers of influence nodes, so maximize the amount of information spread about HIV. And information, as I said, spreads in this independent cascade. One person talks to the next person, next person talks to the next person. So we developed an algorithm called Healer to do this task of trying to figure out which nodes, which homeless youth to select in the social network and educating them about HIV. And we wanted to compare it with the traditional approach. So we, uh, in an initial pilot test, we recruited 60 youth. Uh, Healer and Healer++ are two different variations of our Healer program. Degree centrality is the traditional approach, bring in the most popular youth and educate them. Then our social work colleagues recruited, you know, for these recruited youth, 12 youth recruited here, 12 youth identified as peer leaders using our program, a variation of our program, and in the third condition, 12 youth identified using most popular youth. And so in each case, the social workers educated them about HIV, and after a month's time, the question is, who got more information among the non-peer leaders, the people who we had not brought in for HIV treatment? Where were the HIV testing rates? 
And so after a month's time, here's what happened. Among the non-peer leaders, the ones we had not educated about HIV, with our healer and less programs, you can see 75% of those got educated, uh, got informed about HIV. With the traditional approach, only about 25% got information about HIV. Okay, so they got information, but they actually convert into testing for HIV. And so here's the results. Uh, with our program, you can see 30 to 40% of those who got informed started testing for HIV. And the conversion in the degree centrality case was zero. This is because the base itself rate here is very small. So this is very promising, but it starts out with the assumption that we have the social network in hand in the first place. But in many cases, you know, you're, you, know, you start going to a new homeless youth community, you don't have the social network. So the idea is can we sample by just giving a quiz to a few of the youth this, and, and use that information to get the social network. So we sampled about 18% of the youth, got their social network, and then tested it in you know, simulations, it worked well, but again, we wanted to test it in the, real, in the field. And so we did a new experiment, again recruited 60 homeless youth, again found 12 peer leaders. This time, the social network is estimated by sampling just 18% of the youth. We don't have the full social network in hand. And the question is, would the results of the sampling based algorithm perform just as well as when we knew the full social network. And indeed, what we found is that even after sampling, because we had been somewhat clever in how we sampled, and then selecting peer leaders, we were just as good in terms of spreading HIV information as knowing the full network. And again, the conversion rates were also similar. So this is real hope. And so uh, the collaborators that we've been working with said this. Here's a way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. This really became like a really big thing. It really has had a lot of abuse. Sorry for the uh, noise, the volume level. But the other rewarding thing is the smiling youth that came out of this project. So my colleague and collaborator, uh, Eric Rice of Social Work, was saying, you know, picking youth as peer leaders was changing their self-esteem and sense of confidence. So there's some secondary effects that were also very powerful in terms of what was happening to these peer leaders. So we have completed a study with 900 uh, homeless youth in three homeless shelters, and we'll be publishing these results relatively soon. Let me turn to the final example I wanted to give, which is tuberculosis in India, which is a project that we are working on here uh, with the city in Mumbai. And as you know, tuberculosis, half a million deaths a year in India, three million are infected. And so we are focusing on patients in low resource communities and non-adherence to TB treatment. So you may know there are digital adherence uh, tracking technologies today. And so essentially uh, at the, on the pill pack, there is this phone number, for example, Every time you open the pill, there's a phone number. The patient is supposed to call the phone number. And this is random, so you can't know what that number is in advance. And by calling this, a health worker on the other side can know whether this patient has been taking their pill every day. Because if they get a phone call, they know no, this person has to have taken their pill. Now, if a person has not taken the pill for a few days, they didn't call, for example, then the health worker knows there's a problem. They can go and visit their home or intervene on them to try to get them to adhere to the medicine. But if we can predict in advance who's at risk of dropping out, then we can get them to stop, uh, to, to keep adhering, never have this sort of a dip, and then finding out. So essentially what we are trying to do, this is work done with an uh, NGO called Everwell. So the dashboard that Everwell gets, so this is patient 6204, didn't call on day one, and we have time and day of call, called on day two, called on day three, etc. Patient 6214 call, didn't call on day four and day seven, 6231 didn't call on these three days. So given this week, can we predict what will happen next week? So if we can know in advance, this is what's going to happen next week, right? This is the patient to really focus on. Then out of the hundreds of patients that each health visitor, each health worker has, we can say these are the 10 patients you got to really pay attention to next week because these are at risk of fall, falling off. So we have data from Mumbai, 15,000 patients, 1.5 million phone calls of who called and when. And based on that, we are predicting high-risk patients. Again, 
out of hundreds of patients that a health visit worker may have, or 100 patients, you can see this one didn't call on day one, called on other days, didn't call, called on two days, didn't call on some other days. If we can say these two are the high risk ones to pay attention to, then we would do a good job. And in fact, what we have found is that uh, with our machine learning system, we can predict better than the current baseline system. So true positives go up, false positives go down. And so this is something that we are hoping to test in the near future here. And so this is Bill Thies, uh, saying that this uh, work has a potential to save lives. Hopefully, we will be able to test and work with this. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip through uh, the work on suicide prevention, come to the final part of uh, my presentation. So really, our focus is on use of AI for, and multi-agent systems for social impact. And the cross-cutting challenge, how to optimize limited intervention resources. We have focused on three areas, public safety and security, conservation, and public health. And the unifying themes that, uh, you know, of using multi-agent systems reasoning, this idea of interdisciplinary partnerships, and going from data all the way to deployment, not ending by saying, well, we wrote a written a paper, now we are done, but really trying to deploy everything. So every example that you'll see in our work goes all the way. We want to deploy it, test it in the field, really see it through. So let me uh, come to key lessons that we've learned in all of this work. It is indeed possible to simultaneously advance AI research and do social good. Uh, so in many of these examples, the real AI challenge comes in, for example, because data is not available. So we talk a lot about big data, but in the social impact domains, there's very little data. And so living with little data and working with that becomes a major AI challenge. And I can talk a little bit more about that. This idea of data to deployment perspectives. So we are not just talking about improving algorithms by 10% and publishing papers just on that, but really going all the way from gathering data to actually seeing deployment. And that means that all of these steps have some innovations and so forth, and we want to encourage such innovation and really make sure it goes through. Um, to make all of this happen, for us, it is important as AI researchers to step out of the lab and go into the field and to in embrace interdisciplinary work. Uh, not just uh, by our, we as AI researchers by ourselves can do very little in this space. It can only be done by partnerships with interdisciplinary work, with social workers, with conservation scientists and others. Um, and as I said, lack of data is a norm, a feature. It's part of the project strategy. So often, I'll see, you know, I'll start work, uh, work with newer students, and they say, well, I can't work on this project. There's very little data. But that's, that's the reality. That's just the way it is. And we got to think of it as a feature of the problem, not a bug. And evaluating AI for social impact has to be done differently than traditional AI research. With traditional AI research conferences, you know, you see, okay, there's an algorithmic improvement, great. Here, we are really trying to evaluate impact. We are really trying to figure out how they overcame other difficulties. So that's uh, basically my presentation. Um, I'll end by saying that AI has tremendous potential to improve society and fight social injustice. And that's the, f that's the focus of my lab. That's what we've been focused on. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.